Hello to those who uh, are already joining us. Um, we're going to give it just a minute or so to allow folks to enter today's session before we kick it off with opening remarks. So you'll have still a moment to grab a coffee, uh, a glass of water and do what you need to do to make yourself comfortable as we get into today's session. All right, so let's kick it off. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Innovation Summit. I'm Sam Peck, the Executive Director of Family Councils of Ontario, and I am so glad that you can join us today for this important learning opportunity. I hope that you're as excited as we are to spend the afternoon learning about quality improvement and palliative care in long-term care. What you'll learn in these sessions will provide you with knowledge that you can apply to improve the quality of life of residents in your long-term care home. Before I turn it over to this afternoon's host, we start with a land acknowledgement. Acknowledging the land is an Indigenous protocol used to express gratitude to those who reside here and to honour the Indigenous people who have lived, worked and cared on this land historically and presently. It's important to understand the longstanding history that has brought you to reside here on this land and to understand your place within that history. Now, land acknowledgements don't exist in a past tense or just a historical context. Colonialism is an ongoing and current process and we need to better understand our present participation. I'm coming to you from Hamilton, which is situated upon the traditional territories of the Erie, Neutral, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas. This land is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which was originally an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and the uh, Anishinaabek to share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. As a remote team that works with folks all across Ontario, we encourage our team members, our service users, and our partners to reflect on colonialism's enduring legacy and engage in reconciliation meaningfully. One first step is to visit a website such as Whose Land or Native Land to learn more about the territory your home is situated on. The work that non-Indigenous organizations and individuals need to do towards reconciliation with Indigenous peoples is a long-term journey. It'll be specific to each individual, and it's constantly evolving for us at FCO, but we hope you will join us on our journey. I'm gonna give some special thanks to my team members who helped to put this all together. Uh, Leah Cabral has been working hard in the background on the communications and registration aspect. So thank you very much, uh, Leah. Uh, my other team members, Natasha, Leanne, Dinesh, and Tiffany have been providing input. Uh, but really the most thanks goes to today's host, Kathleen Edwards. Kathleen is FCO's education manager, and it's through her efforts that we are here today to engage in this incredible learning opportunity. Thank you, Kathleen, for all of your hard work to make this event a reality. And to those who have joined us today, we hope that you'll also join us for the Business Expo tomorrow, featuring presentations from various community organizations, including Ambient Activity, Jerry and Modi Tech, plus others, that will provide you with some information on some innovations that might help your long-term care home. So now it is my pleasure to turn it over to today's host, Kathleen, over to you. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. I just realized that I told Hannah that she'd probably start at about 2.15, so she's probably just getting ready to log on with us. Uh, we're very lucky that she fit us into her schedule uh, as she is actively uh, involved with quality care and quality improvement within the Belmont House long-term care home. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Hannah. I'm gonna also tell you a little bit about how I came to picking the two specific topics for the webinars for day one as well as the reasoning behind why I wanted to share the Innovation Summit or day two of this session. 
So um, obviously we have a new piece of legislation, the Fixing Long-Term Care Act, which came into effect April 1st of this year. And some of the interesting additions, specifically some things that are exciting for family councils are the request that family have representation within the quality improvement committees within long-term care homes. Now, councils are probably aware and have conversations with home staff about quality improvement, but it's really nice to have formal recognition of the need for the family's voice to be part of that process within the homes. And so the first webinar today and first session today is really geared towards helping everyone understand, well, what does quality improvement mean? What has been happening in homes before families are getting involved, as well as trying to help you as councils begin to start on your journey and having conversations about quality improvement as you might be approached to be part of this committee, as well as as you receive communication from this committee, what are some questions you can be asking them? And what does it mean for a family council to be involved in uh, these specific types of uh, groups within your home? The next session, again, is going to be focused on palliative care. And again, the focus and choice of that topic draws from the updated Fixing Long-Term Care Act, which has made it more formal that the approach that's gonna be used to care is gonna be taking a palliative care approach. So this session, which I'm really excited about, is going to really talk about, well, what does the palliative care approach mean for long-term care? How is it going to be changing some of the conversations and language and other things that are happening uh, that are going to impact residents, but also impact the ways that families are engaged in caring for their residents in long-term care? So that's the focus of the two sessions that we're going to be having uh, today. And then I'm hoping you'll also join us for tomorrow. So tomorrow is really exciting. Uh, in my previous life, prior to coming to Family Councils Ontario, I worked at the Toronto Rehabilitation Institute, and I was affiliated with an organization called AgeWell. AgeWell is the National Centre for Excellence focused on technology and aging in Canada. And I had the chance to learn about different startups and different products uh, that were in the works to try and help improve the quality of life for seniors across the spectrum of where they were living in Canada. From home-based to long-term care to, you know, retirement homes, there's some really exciting innovation happening uh, through startups. And one of my favorite things I got to do with my time with AGEL was to really go and see demonstrations and to speak to these startups and to ask them questions from my perspective, having worked in long-term care and asking them if they had a product that wasn't used in long-term care, well, have you thought about bringing it to families in long-term care? Um, or in the case of all of these products that we're going to have uh, coming and speaking tomorrow. We do have some type of connection to the long-term care sector, and so it will be great to be able to have you learn about these different organizations with products and services they have to offer and have the chance to ask them questions because some of them are in the startup process and some of them are, you know, established, but it might be a starting point for you as a council to have a conversation with your home about the implementation of some of these different um, services or products within your home to really impact the quality of life of residents. And so that's what tomorrow is going to be about. It's going to be a chance for you to be introduced to some different organizations that you may have never heard about that have some really cool, exciting uh, products and services that you might then be able to bring back to your council and have a conversation with them, invite them to come and speak to your councils, or even have a conversation with a home and see if it's something that can be implemented with the home. I'm just going to mute myself. I am going to turn off my camera. I'm going to say, if you'd like, have a quick second, go grab that coffee, and then uh, we'll be ready to have Hannah uh, get us started.
Hello, everyone. While we're waiting for our first guest speaker to arrive, I'm going to fill you in on some of the other initiatives that we have going on here at FCO that you may be interested in. Our newest program is our curriculum cafes. Now these are monthly events. Uh, each month has a theme and these are interactive learning opportunities. And the way it works is you sign up um, and you'll be registered for the, for the cafes. And each month we'll have some sort of either live or at your own pace pre-learning. For example, in January, our theme will be recruitment a common uh, question topic for councils, you're probably always thinking about recruitment. So for that month, there are some videos we'll ask you to watch in advance. There'll be a webinar that we will be holding on how to develop a recruitment plan. And then later that month will be our cafe session. And it's like a tutorial. So uh, we set aside about an hour to 90 minutes and we come and we uh, discuss the key learnings from that month's topic. And then we discuss scenarios together. So really ways to apply your learning in a really practical way. And you'll be able to chat with the other attendees, give and receive support, share your learnings with each other, uh, talk about what works and what doesn't work at your council. So it's really a great opportunity to build your knowledge and connect with other council members across Ontario. So you can find the information about that on our website. Our January, February and March sessions are scheduled, details are there. And if you join the CAFE series at any time, you'll get access to uh, the previous session recordings and materials. So our sessions are recorded. So that way, if you miss one, you can still catch up but they are available just to registered attendees uh, to maintain really the confidentiality of what we discuss in our cafe sessions. But anyone is welcome to join. Another session that uh, Kathleen actually initiated, another program, is our book club. And this year's book has been by Moira Welsh, Happily Ever Older, which discusses different approaches to caring for aging people across the world. And really, what can we learn from those areas, those ideas, those initiatives to improve long-term care in Ontario? The last session for that book will be next week on December 14th. But rest assured, Kathleen and our team uh, are working on what next year's book club can look like and what those books will be discussed. So it's a fun, uh, interesting uh, way to spend some time with your peers and with the FCO staff. You don't have to have read the book. Uh, you'll still have something that you can learn from the session and the time that you spend with others. As well, our Building Bridges project to improve equity and belonging in long-term care through an anti-racism lens is well underway. That's being led by uh, my colleague Dinesh Ram, our EDI and project manager. So the third and final term uh, will start in January. And this project has trainings on compassion inquiry, which is really a way to build support and compassion for those who have experienced racism within your long-term care home, whether they be staff, family, resident, volunteers. And the other piece of training is the uh, nonviolent communication, which is a way to improve communication skills that allow people to build relationships better relationships so they can engage in difficult conversations more, more easily and more effectively. So you can check that out on our website as well as another really great opportunity for improving your work. And as well, um, we are looking, we have a new e-learning portal which has uh, several e-learning modules available on our website. E-learning is a great self-paced learning opportunity. So it's something that you can go through on your own time. Um, as an individual, you can do it together as a council. And each uh, e-learning course, so we've got several so far, facilitating a family council meeting. So tips for planning and leading a meeting 
conflict resolution in a family council, really looking at how to effectively approach and address conflict. We have how to run a family council. So looking at policies, documentation, and strategies to maintain your council when it's formed. And then if you're new to family council work, or you're with the home that doesn't currently have a family council, Family Council 101 is a great introductory module. It'll provide you with an overview of councils, um, the steps required to start one. We're updating it to, currently updating it to the Fixing Long-Term Care Act, uh, and also best practices for family councils. So there are the four modules that we have right now uh, with two more currently in development. And once you complete a module, you can fill out the form to receive a certificate of completion. So we highly encourage you to take a look at those. Um, they're a great way to either learn something new or brush up on your learnings. And if you appreciate our work, FCO is a registered charity. Now, for over 20 years, we've led and supported families and friends of residents to start and maintain effective councils, work collaboratively with home staff, uh, and engage in public policy. And we have a, um, a somewhat new uh, monthly giving program called Friends of FCO. Now, um, monthly donations can range from, you know, $5, $10 to whatever is within your, your comfort level. Monthly donations are a great way to support our mission, and it helps us with a steady and predictable source of additional funding. We're funded by the Ministry of Long-Term Care, but our friends of FCO contribute to us being able to hold more events, develop new and innovative programs, and just generally try new things to support family councils across Ontario. You can see more about our Friends of FCO on our website, and you can sign up through Canada Helps, which is a really easy way uh, to make one time, if that's uh, more uh, fitting with your giving schedule and your giving approach, but also for monthly donations, and you get a tax receipt directly from Canada Helps. So donate monthly is easy, flexible, it can help you spread out the financial impact of your giving across the year, and it has a great impact for us. So consider um, if FCO fits into your charitable giving this year. And otherwise, uh, we encourage you, if you haven't already, sign up for our e-bulletin. It goes out Wednesdays, prepared by our wonderful uh, Leah Communications Manager and Tay Young, our new bilingual communications specialist. So if you would prefer or know someone who would prefer to receive our e-bulletin in French, we are working on that. So stay tuned for that to come out early in 2023. As well, printable e-bulletins are available as well. So if you like to print it out, give copies out within your long-term care home, put it on a bulletin board, or simply prefer to read something uh, printed versus on your screen, we have something for you as well. Uh, if you wanna sign up for that, you can just contact Leah and they uh, will add you to the list. As well, uh, check us out on social media. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter. Um, it's a great way not only for us to put information out, but you can chat with us there too. You know, comment on, on what we post, ask us questions. Uh, on Twitter, you can see who we follow as well. Maybe, you know, check out new organizations that are connected to long-term care in Ontario. We also put all out uh, or publish a lot of Ministry of Long-Term Care updates via our newsletter, our e-bulletin and our social media. So that's another reason to connect with us because then you'll get the information um, that is relevant to you, uh, including event notifications. So things like this, you'll definitely wanna make sure you're signed up for our, our e-bulletin, our social media um, and connect with what we're doing. Now, we have a little bit more time before our first speaker joins us. So Kathleen, what do you have planned next year um, for our book club? 
So this year we read one book, which had so many great ideas to discuss. That's why we took the whole year for one book. So we'd really have a chance to dig into and digest and really explore all the different approaches to care. So now we understand the Eden alternative, the greenhouse approach, uh, what a dementia village looks like, what, you know, what are some innovative things that are happening in day programs that might be able to be implemented within the uh, long-term care home environment. So hopefully those resources are things you can continue to share. Um, what we'll do is we'll make that the questions as well as the resources available. So if you want to have your own book club within your own family councils or long-term care home community, then those resources will be available for you to uh, read on your own time and share and have that continue the discussion going because we know culture change is something that's going to be ongoing. Um, especially as we look to new ways to, you know, improve the quality of life, how we can transform care. There's some really good ideas, but really having the resources to have the conversation in your home will be great. Uh, so what I want to do is there's a few books I can share that we're going to read. So one is, this is, sorry, you probably can't see it. It's a booklet. It's called Promising Practices in Long-Term Care, Ideas Worth Sharing. And it is a booklet. So it's a book, but it's not like a novel. It's 75 pages. Um, it's by uh, Donna Baines and Pat Armstrong. Pat Armstrong, pretty much, I'm sure everyone has heard of Pat Armstrong and her role uh, in long-term care and her advocacy work. And so what I like is they have, again, similar to with Happily Ever Older, they've explored different approaches to care across Canada and around the world. So um, they use GDP to compare what Canada and Ontario are doing compared to things like what Germany is doing and what Norway is doing. And then they brought some vignettes of different practices that are promising practices that are being implemented both in Canada and in these other uh, you know, countries and looking at, well, what, what's working, what isn't working. Um, so, you know, building on the conversations we had in the book club about things like risk management, when it comes to ideas worth sharing, it gets a little bit more deeper into the risk management uh, into some of those other things we wanted to explore. So it's a really short book um, and we'll probably discuss it just in one month as opposed to having every month be focused on it. However, if there is a lot of interest, I'm happy to explore each section a little bit more deeper, um, but that will probably be the first book that we're reading uh, to kind of build on what we've been exploring this year, but also really looking at, um, you know, how can we dig deeper into culture change? So how can we really start having those conversations about implementing something? And, um, and there's just like, there's so much you can build on from that book as well. Dr. Armstrong, um, ha she's been working on the reimagining long-term residential care, promising practices work for, for a decade now. And really, and looking at what does it mean to age in a healthy way? in residential uh, care. And she takes a really great approach of looking at um, the conditions of work. There's something that, there's a line that she says that I repeat frequently, the conditions of work are the conditions of care. So there is gonna, I'm sure there, there is a ton that you can build on, dig into in that. And if people wanna learn more about her work, there's, just, you can just Google Dr. Pat Armstrong and you will find a ton. So that'll be such a great book to start with. Well, and what I like about it is, so, well, I have a, a, a physical book and you probably can find some of these. Um, it's also digitally available. Mm -hmm. So it's very easy to download a PDF. And if you have like uh, a, an iPad or if you have um, an, a digital book reader. I don't. I like hard copies. So I sit on the screen enough that my eyes just start to twitch. So I need a physical book just because my eyes tell me you need a break from staring at the screen. But if you're okay with, you know, the digital versions, then that is something that when you do sign up for the session, we will make sure that you have a downloaded copy. Um, so you that's not a barrier to joining the sessions. Um, what I also like about this book is that there's a number of series in them. So there's this one, but there's a few others that are focused more on like the physical environment or getting into um, issues tied to care. Um, you know, so I like it because it's a good starting point. It's a very high level and just a logical progression from where we've been. But if you want to get into the nitty gritty and it's something that's very popular, then we can explore some of those aspects. Building off of the fact that it's going to be Alzheimer's Awareness Month in January, after we read that book, 
our next book is going to be something called The Last Ocean, A Journey Through Memory and Forgetting. Um, it is a book that's written by someone who was a caregiver uh, mm -hmm. to a parent with dementia. They do live in the UK, but what I like is that they share a little bit about their story. They explore things like what they, how they view aging and ageism, mm -hmm. which is something that's interesting to think about as you're a caregiver. Um, what do you feel? What do you think about what you're also experiencing? Experiencing or what you're seeing happen how do your how does your understanding of aging kind of shape what you do as a caregiver the things that you say um she did with her father engage in some arts based uh mm. intervention so I do like it so it's one where we'll be highlighting certain chapters so you won't have to read the entire book unless you really enjoy uh the author's writing we might just highlight and explore a few chapters um but I do like in the sense that it talks about the caregiver's journey from someone who was a caregiver but also explores how they use the arts based programs to connect with their parent mm -hmm. um and kind of draws on their professional experience as well because I do believe they also worked for the um health services in the UK or they were an academic doing mm -hmm. research with people dementia and then it happened in their family uh so it'll be a nice narrative and the reason that I picked it is just again um looking at we're going to be talking about Alzheimer's and dementia in January and in the winter uh, I know there's that push for awareness and we know that it impacts so many residents in long-term care so hopefully this might give you some ideas as a council of what you might want to do. I do know that there are a few councils uh, who have successfully implemented things like iPod projects based on approaching the administrator and saying, hey, we think this is a great idea. Can we reach out to the local Alzheimer's Society and get this up and running within our home for our people? Um, so it might give you some other ideas of what you might want to do as a council as you're starting to shift past, you know, navigating through COVID-19. Now's the time where you're as a council regrouping, refocusing and trying to think about, well, what projects and what things can you do within your home to really make a difference? And so that's where today's session on quality improvement comes in or talking about palliative care. And I know that there was a council that approached the administrator uh, because they were on a campus of care. So there was an adjacent um hospital that had a really strong palliative care program and they wanted to implement it within their home and they've now got a palliative care committee uh, within their home. So I think there's a number of really exciting different ways of looking at what you as a council will be able to do moving forward in the new year. I hope that you view the book club as one way to have those discussions to get some ideas, but also with the educational programming at FCO, that's really something that we're hoping to have happen is that we're really trying to think about what are some ways we can give you ideas of what you can do uh, to just be a partner in care, to really impact the quality of life of your person, uh, to really work with the staff uh, and bring ideas to them and then say, well, what can we do to help you get this happening in our home? So hopefully you're finding all of this is very helpful to your work as councils and inspiration and things that you can go back and you can tell those who weren't able to come say, you really should come to this session next time. You're going to get so many different ideas and really build up that excitement within your home community. And there's just so many books around aging, dementia. Um, what does it mean to, to care? So um, maybe you have a suggestion, you know, council members, caregivers out there uh, across Ontario. So share your suggestions with us. You know, tag us on, on Twitter or Facebook or send us an email. What books have really resonated with you throughout your journey uh, as a caregiver, as a, uh, you know, a partner to someone you know, getting older or living with dementia, whether it's a memoir, or a, you know, uh, something that's a little bit more academic around aging. There's, there's so much out there, whether it's science, memoir, humor. Apparently, William Shatner has a book uh, around getting older. Uh, Betty White had a memoir as well. So there are um, lots of memoirs of really famous people and then others that are really looking at the, the experience of caregivers and caring. One of the, uh, when we had done a, a book club several years ago, a bit of a, a one-off, we read um, uh, Making Rounds with Oscar. 
And if you've read that one, it's, and, and I'm a cat person. So that's a, one of the reasons I loved it so much was about a cat at a nursing home in the States who seemed to know when people were dying. Um, and perhaps that cat had, you know, an inside scoop on palliative care and, you know, quality improvement and uh, what that can mean to, to a long-term care home. But uh, so Kat, thanks for the chat, letting us know what is coming up in 2023. Hard to believe it's already the end of 2022, but I will turn it back over to you to kick off uh, the first session for this afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sam. So Hannah is now here. Hi, Hannah. We're so glad that you can join us. Uh, apologies for the issues with Zoom. Um, it's always so much fun <laughs> when you're in person, you know, you're in the right space or, you, you know, you try to get there, but digital, it's a little bit of a transition. So we're so glad to have you. You should also be able to share your screen if you do have slides that you want to share with us. So I'll give you a little bit of time to get your feet settled and, uh, I'll read a little bit of a brief bio about who you are. So that way everyone can kind of get to know who you are. So Hannah is the quality and education coordinator at Belmont house, um, which is a nonprofit charitable organization and long-term care home that was founded in 1852. Um, and how I met Hannah was she was giving a talk to administrators, and I want to say it was for Vantage Ontario, about quality improvement. And she did such a great job of not just speaking to the role that administrators and staff play, but she also did a really good job speaking to the, um, how the families are engaged in providing input and involved in the quality improvement set um, process at Belmont House. And so that's why she's here today to kind of share a little bit about what that is and how you as councils can get involved in supporting your home. So I will let Hannah take over and uh, when she's ready, I will launch her poll. So I'm just here to support and I will also help with questions at the end. Awesome. Thank you for that, Kathleen. Um, so hi, everyone. I am pleased to be here and thank you to Family Councils Ontario and Kathleen for inviting me and having me. Um, so yeah, let's start with that poll. Um, so I just have one question. Um, so does your home have a continuous quality improvement committee? And we'll just take stock of uh, the responses. Okay, um, so that looks great. So it looks like there is a good amount of um, quality improvement committees uh, that may have been kicking around uh, some new uh, newly formed committees. And for the don't knows and knows, um, it may be that uh, the home is still in the process of getting it up and running, um, or maybe, um, it's possible that uh, it's kind of a smaller low key committee that uh, there's no awareness of it just yet. Um, so we can end that poll, but that's uh, good to just take stock of. Um, okay, so. So as Kathleen mentioned, just a quick introduction about Belmont. We are, uh, as Kathleen mentioned, a nonprofit charitable Christian home we're right downtown, uh, just uh, at Bay and Davenport. We are considered a campus of care. So that means that we have a long-term care um, side as well as a retirement living side. Um, in long-term care, we have 140 beds and 81 retirement apartments. And myself, I'm the quality and education coordinator, uh, which is considered the quality lead for the home. However, uh, management and the what we call the interdisciplinary team are all pretty much involved in quality and quality is somehow embedded in all the work that we do. 
Okay, so to understand quality improvement, let's try and break it down a little bit. Um, so we'll just kind of look at the two components and bring them back together. So taking a look at quality, uh, this can mean data um, in terms of how data is collected, where it will come from, collecting it in such a way that is effective, efficient, and inclusive. This also means how will the data be validated to ensure that you know, it is accurate and representative of uh, the aim um, or whatever reason that you're collecting it for. Um, next, we need a way to measure this data and understand the rates to let us know what to work towards. So this is our analysis. And in quality improvement terms, this is referred to as indicators. Um, indicators may already be defined for us, such as those uh, the province has nicely de defined and prioritized for us. Um, so examples from the province would be the number of avoidable ED visits, which is usually presented as a percentage. And um, another common one uh, specific to long-term care is the number of residents who feel they have a voice and can speak without fear of consequence. So that's a pretty important one. The next thing is understanding the data, and this is um, analysis here and what the data is telling us. What does it mean? Uh, so for example, what does it mean when there's a spike in numbers? What does it mean when there's a drop in numbers? What are the implications? Um, and as well, the desired rate for each of these will be different. So for example, uh, for um, number of avoidable ED visits, a lower rate is desirable because that you know would show that if it's an avoidable visit, you're you're, you're meeting that. Whereas a higher rate reflects something that you want to see uh, better of. So as an example, residents feel that they have a voice, a higher rate of a response to that would be ideal. And the last few points here refer to practice standards, regulations, uh, compliance uh, with those will be a measurement of quality, certainly. And lastly, some homes might ought to be accredited as a way, again, it's a, a, just another way, another layer to demonstrate excellence in their uh, quality and safety practices. Okay, so now over to improvement. So on the right side, so improvement can refer to evaluating outcomes. It might mean organizing uh, an improvement project or an improvement initiative. It could be taking a corrective action to address an issue. It might also mean addressing gaps and closing that gap. Uh, it could just be you know, implementing something different, implementing a change. And improvements can be based on the values and strategic goals and directions of the home. And lastly, <clears throat> improvement is continuous. So the bar is always moving. There are always new uh, evolutions, uh, iterations, depending on what's going on in the environment and you know, even the political climate. So we can look at improvement as part of a continuous cycle of change and progress. Okay, so when we put it together, quality plus improvement, uh, we get quality of care, quality of services, resident safety, and even positive health outcomes, and also building and fostering meaningful partnerships. So let's go a little bit into how this is practiced and it, in a number of different ways. So this is just a part of a communication piece that we distribute to families to illustrate the different ways that families feed into quality improvement. And so there may be um, ways that you may not even know that you're contributing to quality improvement, whether or not you're involved in a committee or a council. So QI can happen at an individual level or an organizational level. Uh, it is already happening during the admissions process. Uh, so this would be at an individual level. And residents and families at this point are providing input into their care and needs and preferences. 
Um, so over here on the right, uh, the legislation now mandates that satisfaction surveys are to be conducted annually. Uh, so this is another important tool for families to provide their feedback to homes and how homes can collect this quantifiable data to base their goals and aims on. So it would be important to know when your home is doing their surveys, um, and each home has their own timeline when they do them. Uh, there's no deadline for them, but just that they're done at some point in the year. Uh, care conferences are another opportunity, again, on an individual level to discuss care and needs as they change. So status at the time of admission may not be the same uh, a few months down the road or a year. Um, so these care conferences are a way that, you know, you are implementing uh, quality improvement changes and possibly that staff are uh, responding and adjusting um, the care and perhaps procedures and processes to accommodate those changes. Um, so I'm just going to jump down here to complaints before I uh, go back up to the other boxes. Um, so every home will have a formal complaints process, and certainly this is another way that can facilitate any major issues and addressing them and perhaps initiate, again, a quality improvement project or initiative. Uh, but for day-to-day -day, uh, matters, there's always good old direct feedback or voicing your concerns to staff um, who will listen to concerns and perhaps bring them forward at a departmental level, and then adjustments can be made where needed. So coming back now to uh, councils, depending on the type of home, there are homes that, you know, are only long term care, others might be only retirement, and then others are a campus of care where they offer both services. So there may be um, one council that encompasses, you know, the entire home or they there may be more than one council and they may interact with each other or not. It really depends on the makeup of the home. In any case, this would be a formal way of getting involved and really getting your feet wet when it comes to quality improvement. Um, and at this level, you are looking at, you know, higher level matters, organizational levels of change. Okay, so as mentioned, you can get involved in a family council. And as of this year, uh, um, Continuous Quality Improvement Committee or a CQY committee is a new requirement for the ministry. Um, so it's based on new legislation that homes are to form CQY committees as of October this year. Uh, homes can decide for themselves how to organize this committee. So um, per the act, you have to have this committee in place, but how you assemble it that's up to each home. Um, and this might include how members are selected or perhaps appointed, the length of terms, reporting structures, the frequency of meetings, um, maybe how decisions are made, how the quality improvement work is carried out. Uh, so the, the home's leadership and governance is pretty autonomous in this sense. So essentially, the legislation is pushing for more transparency, communication, and consultation when it comes to quality improvement, if this is not already a practice in the home. Um, and the legislation also outlines the responsibilities of the quality committee, and their responsibilities would be to monitor and report on quality issues, residents' quality of life, and overall quality of care and services. Um, they would also need to consider, identify, and make recommendations regarding priority areas for quality improvement and coordinate and support the implementation of quality improvement initiatives, activities, projects, etc. And this is based on the home's practices. So there are a lot of things to consider. Again, we're going to break this down and look at those things to consider, and we'll look at it with regards to the home, about families who get involved, and then we'll take a look at the actual committee or the council. Um, so starting on this side here, uh, with things to think about with regards to the home. Um, so 
you might want to consider the home's experience with uh, continuous quality improvement. It is important to know that some homes may be brand new to the world of uh, quality improvement. It is a science in itself, and it is a formal process. So there might be a learning curve as homes are figuring out what works best for them, or they're still getting their committee off the ground. Um, while for others, it might be status quo. Uh, so it's beneficial to understand what the home's starting point is. And if it is a home that's starting from, from scratch, um, you know, the, understand there will be growing pains and kinks, and that's okay. That's part of the learning process. Um, whereas at the other end of the spectrum, where homes have a wealth of experience and expertise, uh, they may already have established practices, they might already know what works for them and what doesn't. So just try to be mindful of where homes are at. Um, another thing to consider is the availability of resources. So some homes might have a lot of resources to dedicate to quality improvement, um, while for other homes, quality improvement might be, um, you know, just one piece of the pie that uh, someone is working on under their portfolio where, you know, they might have uh, be wearing different hats. So you know, when giving input into goals, objectives for quality improvement, consider your SMART goals. So, you know, you've got your specific, your measurable, your achievable. So that's going to be pretty uh, crucial, also um, relevant and timely. And another consideration for the home is that QI means trial and error. So, you know, as I mentioned, growing pains and kinks, it's part of the learning. Some homes might try things out and if it works and it creates meaningful change and improvement, that's great. But there will be times that it doesn't work and it could be because of timing, resources, things just don't click. Maybe it's because of um, uh buy-in or just uh, evaluating processes or the rules needed for the team. So there's, in any case, there's still something to take away from that and some learning that can be gained from that. Okay, so over to the other side, um, considering uh, the involvement of families. So quality improvement expertise is not needed to be involved. However, you would need to be able to think broadly about the organization as a whole, um, understand the home strengths, challenges, pressure points, and again, the availability of resources. So these are now considerations specific for the committee or the council. Of course, you are working towards a common goal, uh, using inclusive and respectful communication that honors the diversity around the table. When uh, we're re referring to big dot, little dot, uh, this is being able, again, to be able to think broadly about the organization. So, you know, when um, perhaps the, the committee is going through brainstorming uh, for improvements or, you know, setting priorities, uh, being able to zoom in and out and thinking about the different levels of change. Is it at an individual level or an organizational level? And also considering the implications of the change and all the contributing factors. So this ties nicely with our next point, risk management strategies. Um, so just be aware that, you know, in terms of um, sometimes, you know, in the, the world of COVID and uh, respiratory illnesses, sometimes these events are not preventable, uh, but, you know, you're kind of uh, pivoting a lot and trying to understand maybe when you're setting goals, how you might lessen the impact and the harm uh, when, you know, you can't just remove or prevent these events from happening. So setting goals in this in, with my, in mind will be helpful. And in, again, ensuring that the goals are smart goals, that they're achievable and relevant and timely, et cetera. Think of opportunities for learning and education. Um, it might be uh, embedding some material into the orientation process for new uh, council or committee members. 
And lastly, quality improvement, it's not just about what needs to be fixed, what's wrong, what's bad. Um, it's, it's about, as I mentioned, it's closing those gaps, maybe trying to do things that you're already doing well and just doing them in an even better way um, that is maximizing you know, effectiveness, efficiency, et cetera. Um, but quality improvement is also very much about celebrating successes and reflecting on the journey towards improvement and change. So I'll just share some of Belmont's approach to quality improvement. So our own philosophy for quality is meeting residents' needs and exceeding expectations and doing the right things well. And we do this through structured processes that selectively identifies and improves all aspects of care and service. And we recognize that this is continuous and it's ongoing. So our CQI committee, it is comprised of a board level committee and um, it says subcommittee here, but we now refer to it as an operational committee. Um, so family members are represented at the board level here, um, and they are interacting with and making decisions alongside board members, and that's what we felt uh, would work for us, and again, other homes are different, um, whereas the operational, or how it's labeled here as the subcommittee, um, it's exactly what the title suggests, it is, uh, it deals with day-to-day -day operations, so for that reason, it is comprised only of staff. But the two interact and they work together and there is a reporting um, uh, structure between the two committees. So this is our timeline. And again, this is what works for us based on our cycle of meetings and the way that we schedule them. So we start our cycle in the fall and we begin with input on the satisfaction survey questions from family councils and resident councils and the CQI committees. We're reporting on actions to all the councils and committees from the previous year's satisfaction surveys, as well as other quality improvement initiatives that were going on in the home. And at this time, we're also injecting some education and awareness of quality improvement processes and measures. And uh, we distribute a newscast, which I will share a snapshot of on the next slide. And the newscast does a summary of the activities and the responses from the previous year's survey, just so people have it in their minds that, you know, the survey's coming up, this is how we performed last year, and then also reflecting on uh, some of the actions that came out of that survey. We also do an email bust and we set up a poster board display in the home just so uh, family members, however, you know, they're able to uh, get that information will will somehow interact with it. So later in the fall, uh, usually by October, we're conducting the satisfaction survey and it goes out to residents, uh, to the family members, as well as the tenants uh, who are living in uh, retirement living. By January, we usually get our results back and we're presenting them to the councils and the committees and we get input that will help us set uh, priorities and uh, actions to address any uh, areas that indicate, you know, a need for improvement based on the survey results. And at this time, we're also together with the councils and the committees, we're setting priorities for the upcoming years. Uh, continuous quality improvement plan. And we align this with the requirements um, and priorities of the province. So there is uh, another requirement with Ontario Health for all homes to submit a quality improvement plan. And so that's also, uh, we consult with the councils and committees on that. In the spring, uh, Chi High data becomes available. So Chi High is the Canadian Institute for Healthcare Information. Um, they are a repository for healthcare data, and there are publicly reported indicators for different types of facilities, such as hospital, rehab, primary care, and long-term care. 
So CAIHAI makes their reports available at this time. And this report is useful in some ways, but it also has its limitations. Um, so it's useful to think of it as a report card of how we stand in comparison to other homes in our region, as well as uh, compared to the province and across Canada. So um, it might guide us in setting goals, but we would certainly not rely on this report alone. Um, it is a snapshot on the previous year's data. So that's that might be something useful to know. Um, and so by the time the report comes out, it is a little out of date because as I said, it's based on the previous years. But again, we treat it like a report card and we would use this report together with real time data, which all homes would have access to via um, their electronic medical record system uh, analytical feature, um, as well as any internal data that we're already collecting. So that's our year summarized for quality improvement. Uh, this is a snapshot of our quality improvement newscast. And um, uh, personally, I feel that a good communication tool is always helpful in providing an, an understanding and kind of giving everyone um, a bit of a backgrounder. So this is where you might raise awareness of, you know, what exactly is quality improvement? How is the home practicing it? And what has the home been working on? Um, at Belmont, uh, and this may be similar in other homes, but we have some family members who have had loved ones here for years, uh, but we are starting to see a more transient group of families because of um, increases in uh, crisis admissions and shorter stays. So this piece is great uh, to use as a refresher for those long-standing families, but also uh, perhaps an orientation for new families who might want to get involved. Okay, so I'd like to highlight one of our major QI initiatives that we are working on right now, the Butterfly Program. So the inception of the Butterfly Program, it started out as a QI initiative, and it sort of gained a life of its own. Uh, we went through an exploration of a model of care that would improve the quality of life for residents living with dementia. We looked at different models. Uh, we went through a consultative process and got a lot of input from residents and families. So in the end, Belmont felt that having an emotion-centered model of care would best suit uh, the growing needs of our uh, residents, per particularly those living with dementia. So we began this process in late 2019, and then as the story goes, the pandemic happened. So we experienced a lot of uh, stops and starts to getting this project off the ground, uh, but we're proud that we have forged ahead. So we've done a lot of staff training on what this model of care entails in terms of um, approach to care, meaningful engagement, interactions with residents, um, and as well, we've been uh, going through a physical transformation. So you can see the the really perfect um, analogy of, you know, transforming from a caterpillar all the way to a butterfly. Um, it's been transforming, you know, the way that we do care uh, and the way we practice um, engagement and, and care for residents and as well the physical space. So we've been spending a lot of time um, planning and creating interactive displays that reflect the interests and values of the residents and also transforming it so that it feels like a home. So you can see here, um, uh, every resident has their own personal uh, door, which is a, a decal. Uh, we've got the brick uh, wallpaper in place, so it feels like they're entering, you know, they're walking up to their front porch and uh, walking into their home. And uh, there's been much more transformation since then. Um, uh, and we've also established practices. And again, this is all part of the formal uh, quality improvement processes in terms of the goals. Um, and with that comes practices. So this includes uh, some of the more administrative things such as audits, checklists, implementing huddles uh, for staff. 
So the program is being piloted on one unit to begin with, and then there will be an evaluative process. And again, that's part of the cycle of improvement before we scale it up and spread it across uh, to the rest of the home and in the other units. So that's something that we continue to make progress on and we continue to look forward to even more changes in the next year. Okay, so thank you for your attention. Uh, I hope I have planted some seeds of interest in the world of quality improvement, or at least uh, provided some insights as to how homes might be practicing it. Um, thank you again to Kathleen and Family Council Ontario for inviting me today. Thank you. Hi, Hannah. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. We do have a number of questions. And uh, if you haven't already done so and you have a question, please feel free to use the Q&A feature to type in your question. You can post it with your name or you can post it anon anonymously. I can't speak today. I'm getting tongue tied. Must be a Wednesday. <laughs> um, so your first question is, um, does the Ministry of Long-Term Care or the Fixing Long-Term Care Act define certain quality improvement goals, such as engagement of residents and families? Um, or is that something that's kind of up to each home to decide on what those specific uh, goals would be? Okay, um, great question. So uh, if we're talking of the Long-Term Care Homes Act, so the Fixing Long-Term Care Homes Act, um, so the legislation provides uh, requirements in terms of having a committee in place, but not necessarily the goals. And it just outlines the responsibilities in terms of monitoring uh, quality of life, um, quality of care and services, but it is up to each home to decide what those goals will be. Will be. But having said that, there's sort of that other layer. So there's um, Ontario health requirements uh, where they do have priority indicators, which um, uh, why whether it's the work uh, homes decide that this will become the work of the council, the committees, or this will be a focus for staff departments. Um, that will, again, be another um, decision that each home will make. Uh, but the priority indicators will give direction as to, you know, what sort of activities homes might uh, want to undertake. And those priority indicators, um, if I remember correctly, focus on um, number of ED visits. Um, they look at residents' ability to uh, express themselves, uh, that they have a voice, uh, they can express themselves without fear of consequence. And I think the fourth one is um, uh, use of antipsychotic medication uh, without a diagnosis of um, psychosis. So yeah, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Um, so because I found families might have different perspectives than staff in home, in, pro in part of the consultation, um, how could a family council bring specific indicators or goals um, that they have in mind to the discussion with the home? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So again, it depends on the makeup of the home and how um, the meetings are conducted, I would say, you know, by way of the family council meeting, um, if, uh, you know, there's an opportunity in the agenda just to raise um, uh, suggestions or concerns, then this would be definitely a platform where you can bring those forward. Um, there is a, a requirement now to report back on uh, satisfaction surveys, so the home might already have an idea based on families' responses to satisfaction surveys as to, you know, what areas that they might want to focus on. And that discussion of the satisfaction survey is a really good link to the next question. So is there a gold standard for a satisfaction survey, um, or uh. is it kind of up to each home to create their own satisfaction survey? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, there is no standard right now. Um, some homes uh, based on their um, 
sort of association uh, provincially and as well as regionally, they will work together to um, decide on, you know, comprehensive questions. There are um, certain questions that are required that you do an evaluation on. So that includes special programs, um, including falls management, skin and wound. Um, I think it's medication. Uh, I might not be remembering correctly, so don't quote me on that. Uh, I think also continence, um, continence care. So though, so homes at minimum would have those uh, questions that focus on the evaluation of those um, areas of care, uh, as well as, um, again, based on the provincial uh, priority indicators, they would integrate a question, of course, on, you know, do, do you feel that your loved one or does the resident feel that they have a voice um, and they can speak up without fear of reprisal? So, uh, so to answer your question, kind of yes and no, there are, um, there are standards based on the legislation to evaluate certain programs and um, questions that the that come up in the Ontario Health um, priority indicators, but uh, it's not per se in the Fixing Long Term Care Homes Act. So with the survey, um, from your perspective, having getting to go through the analysis, what types of questions you find are most helpful to give your committee useful information in developing, you know, your, what are you going to move or how are you going to move forward with what you learn? Is it more the fixed, like rate things on a scale of three, five or 10, or is it more the open-ended, more qualitative questions where you get some really good insight and data? Okay, um, again, great question. Uh, I would say a bit of both. Um, when we're presenting, uh, and it might be different uh, depending on the makeup of the council versus the quality, the CQI committee, um, and whether they're separate or whether they're integrated, it's going to depend. Um, but what we tend to do is we'll bring kind of the snapshot questions to the council. And this is where any family member, uh, you know, you don't have to be. Um, um, you know, uh, like a core member or like an official member, anybody can join in on those meetings. Um, so uh, bearing that in mind, we kind of do just like a, a Coles Notes version um, where it's rate the home. Um, would you recommend the home to a family member or a friend? And um, I can't remember if it's those, uh, you know, do you feel that you have a voice? Uh, in the home. So those are kind of like the snapshot questions that right away looking at the response to those will give you an idea of generally how people are feeling about the home as a whole. Um, and then we may, uh, you know, at a committee level where we can kind of zone in on specific areas, then we would drill down into, you know, the finer details and the questions that relate to uh, continence care or meals or uh, recreational programming. Wonderful. Um, so you talked about how you have those two different committees within Belmont House. Um, so if more than one family council representative is interested in participating and intend attending on those committees, um, how should that be approached within the home? Um, so this council currently only the chair was invited to attend, but other members of the executive would also like to attend. And given what we know about turnover in membership, um, I think having more than one person attend might be beneficial just to the continuity for the committee. So, okay. Um, yeah, so another great question. Uh, again, that's going to depend on the makeup of the home. For For Belmont, it made sense to um, have a representative from uh, family council and resident council sit on that particular committee. Um, it could also be that there wasn't a lot of appetite to attend more than one meeting. Um, so for other homes, they might have separate members that are attending, you know, these separate meetings um, that is separate of council and the CQI committee. Um, so I, again, I think that's really up to each individual home um, to kind of field the, the interest. If there is, um, you know, a growing interest where more than one family member wants to attend, I, I, I would say that's, that is up to the, the individual home. 
Perfect. Um, so can councils or what do you think would be the best way for a council uh, to make a request to have at least one member part of the um, quality committee? Because I know as it's written in the act, it doesn't say specifically it has to be from the family council. It just yeah. says a family member. Um, so yeah. how can family councils make sure that that voice does their approach first, maybe beyond someone who's not part of that council within their home? Yeah, yeah. So again, this goes back to kind of understanding the where the home is at in terms of their quality processes. Um, they might have a reason for limiting, um, you know, the number of family members. Um, I, I would say that you can always put the request through. You can always um, express in writing or express it in the family council meeting that, you know, there is more than one member interested. Um, and again, it would depend on the home's ability to uh, be able to, um, I guess, facilitate that. Thank you. Um, so if a council wants to see additional options or comments available in the survey, um, just so they can contribute ideas, um, how could they offer to add um, certain wording or questions onto the survey? What would be the best approach for a council if they do have an idea of things that would probably be helpful information for the home to explore? Um, how could they make those suggestions? Okay, this is great. Um, so I would suggest when you receive the satisfaction survey um, question, no, take note of uh, you know, the phrasing of the questions or take note of the questions themselves. And you can always bring it back to family council uh, for the previous year. So obviously, once the survey's already gone out, it's kind of, you know, um, you're not able to change it then. But it, there's always the next year. Uh, sorry, I said previous year. I should have said next year. Uh, for the following year, you can always suggest um, uh, and give input. So that is... Um, I now again I can't recall exactly if there's a requirement or if it's um, uh, strongly recommended that family members be consulted on uh, you know the makeup of the questions and uh, some I believe that family councils are able to add on if they wish uh, if they wish to add on you know one or two extra questions that are home specific. Thank you so much. So I know you were talking about the different questions and someone wanted to know what ED stands for in the number of ED visits. Oh, ED is a emergency department. Um, so emergency department visits, it is uh, one of the, the priority uh, statistics that Ontario Health is looking at to look at quality of care across homes. Um, so a lower number is desirable. Um, but having said that, again, um, I, I did mention just considering all the factors, considering, um, you know, everything that might be feeding into, you know, what, so, so what I mean to say is, um, don't get excited if you do, if you find that your home has a higher rate of something or a lower rate of another thing, um, consider all the surrounding factors. Uh, and there may be qualitative uh, explanations to fill in. So for example, there are some homes who have, who, they do have a higher rate of ED visits. And, um, and when they do an analysis and, you know, really break down the details behind that number, they find that it's because family members um, are anxious, you know, they, they want to send their loved ones off uh, to hospital um, just to make sure everything's okay. So um, I, I have heard that some homes are doing, are addressing that by way of education. So educating families on what can be handled in the home um, and, you know, what would be scenarios or circumstances where it makes sense to send a loved, a loved one um, out to the emergency department and when uh, something is manageable in the home. Um, but of course, the home will always listen to the family member and the resident's wishes and will always go by that. But that's just a little uh, tidbit just to keep in mind when we're thinking of these stats and these numbers and what they mean. 
Thank you so much. Um, so someone, uh, and I know I mentioned I wanted you to talk about the family role and how family councils can get involved in quality improvement, but the other aspect is also having residents involved as a stakeholder in quality improvement. So can you speak to at Belmont House how you engage with residents as well as families as members of the quality improvement committees? Yeah, definitely. So uh, we do have a resident council. And again, there is um, a member of resident council who is represented on the quality committee. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're engaging in, in those ways I mentioned through, by way of the uh, satisfaction survey. Residents who are able to, they do take part in their own, um, uh, you know, decisions in terms of care planning during the admissions process. Um, and they are involved uh, in um, reviewing the satisfaction survey that is specific for residents. So they do give input into that. And then the results of that are uh, presented back to residents where they can then um, uh, give input into the actions that we're now going to take to address the results of the survey. Thank you. Um, I wanted to know more about the butterfly uh, approach that you're implementing. So it's implemented now. So I'm guessing that you're getting the data. And with this year's quality data, you're going to be deciding how you're going to be scaling it up or how are you going to make any changes? So um, what are the plans moving forward once you get that information to see it either scale up or to see it kind of adapted before you scale it up within other areas of the home? Yeah, so yeah, this is, it's been really exciting just to see the transformation on the floor and even the, the change in residents. So residents who, um, you know, would kind of be not as much engaged are now walking around, interacting with um, the different activities, the things that we have up on the walls and, um, you know, really creating that feeling of home. So um, so as Kathleen mentioned, yeah, we, we are looking at uh, certain uh, data and particular indicators we're looking at are um, resident uh, to resident aggressive uh, behaviors, resident to staff um, aggressive um, responsive behaviors, I should say. Um, we're also looking at the use of um, medication, so uh, antipsychotic medication, and looking at uh, falls management as well, so residents um, uh, whether they're falling. Um, so uh, looking at all of that, we will be going through um, an evaluation and uh, an accreditation process by the uh, organization that we partnered with, who is, um, uh, so it is a proprietary um, model of care. Uh, so it is being facilitated by Meaningful Care Matters. So they are the organization, the partner organization. Um, so we go through uh, an accreditation process before we can say that, okay, we are an accredited butterfly um, unit for this particular unit. And then once, uh, hopefully when we receive accreditation for that, then it becomes scaled up to the other units. And then at that point, we go through through sort of another um, uh, phase of change, implementing everything. Uh, and then I believe there's another step where uh, it's kind of another accreditation before we can say we are a butterfly home. So yeah, that's what we're looking forward to. That's very exciting because uh, I know in our book club we have talked about the butterfly approach and so it's exciting to hear that other homes are deciding to implement the approach and trying it through quality improvement. Um, there's a question about the connection between the Ontario health teams and the long-term care homes in their catchment area. Um, so are they partners in quality improvement? So do Ontario health teams um, work with the long-term care homes in their area with their quality improvement surveys? Okay, um, so this, uh, to be honest, I'm not too well versed in. I do not, I do know that um, Ontario uh, long-term care homes that are part of a, um, an Ontario health team um, do have an option of submitting um, what they call an integrated quality improvement plan. So certainly, you know, the feedback in terms of goals, objectives that would uh, feed into that. Um, and uh, as to what the focus has been, I, I'm sorry, I'm not well versed in that. 
No worries, not a problem. Um, there's another question about um, can all caregivers get a copy of the satisfaction survey or is it just one uh, power of attorney or a substitute decision maker? Um, and of course the resident who complete the surveys. Okay, so um, so there would be two separate surveys. There would be the resident, one specific for residents, and then another version that would go to families. Um, I think typically the practice has been that it's one family member per resident um, that could respond to the survey. Um, but having said that, uh, sometimes there's miscommunication between family members and then uh, the home ends up receiving a couple from the, the same family anyway. Um, uh, but there's no way to, to distinguish that because they are anonymous. So uh, it would just, uh, you know, be uh, um, included in, in the analysis. So um, because uh, the quality improvement does draw from the satisfaction uh, surveys, are our family councils allowed to review comments from the satisfaction surveys? Uh, yeah, so I believe they do, um, at least for in terms of Belmont's practices. So we do share uh, comments, we share, um, you know, uh, the, the results of the, the satisfaction survey. Thank you. Um, so this is a question. So it asks, how can council members actually be influential? We're encouraged not to change uh, satisfaction questions from year to year in order to allow comparison. Um, although they attend the quality improvement meetings, they're so new at it, they don't know when or how to influence choice of goals or just the implementation in general. So what tips might you give to a council that really does want to try to shape uh, the surveys and really try and, I guess, um, support the idea that there might be a benefit to changing some questions year to year, because some questions might not be as relevant as others. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that that's a good point. Um, there, there does tend to be um, the carryover of questions, just so there is a basis for comparison. Um, so I would suggest in terms of you know, influencing change. Um, another way you could approach it is looking at the different areas in which that you in which you want to see change happen. So, uh, from what I understand, there are kind of additional smaller surveys that happen depending on uh, the different departments. So. Um, and it could arise from the initial satisfaction survey, or it could just be initiated because the department feels that uh, they want feedback at that time. Um, so there is, um, uh, depending again on the home and what the system they have in place, uh, for recreation, there is a way to be able to give impact um, input, pardon me, into uh, activities by way of a kind of a smaller, uh, what I believe is quarterly uh, recreation survey. Um, in terms of uh, meal times and uh, the meal time experience, some uh, some years I believe uh, Belmont's dietary department would you know put out um, you know some options. Uh, to family members. So if if you can't, um, if the home is not in a position where they're able to, you know, overhaul the survey uh, based on family feedback, there are still ways, uh, you know, in those smaller settings and those smaller departmental focus areas that you might still be able to uh, influence uh, change and look at some goals. Thank you. That's a really good suggestion. Yeah. So just looking at is there a specific department and I know someone asked a question about recreation and wanting to look at can there be questions tied to recreation. So yes, if you did focus in on, you know, examining recreation, especially during outbreaks and looking at how are they shifting services, um, or maybe even supporting families in the implementation of, you know, how can you as a caregiver implement some type of programming. Um, Mm -hmm. Tomorrow, we're going to have a group speak about um, a little bit about tablet games that are accessible for people with dementia. So, you know, how can you work with the rec department when things like outbreaks happen to have tablets available that are very easy to disinfect between use, but can make it easy for a caregiver to have some type of one on one recreation with their loved one when they're visiting. Um, so I know part of what happens after you get the surveys is that you create a, a, uh, an action plan. So how can family members and residents shape those action plans that result from the surveys? 
Okay, shaping the action plan. Yeah. Um, so I would suggest at the point when the action plan is shared with um, with the council or the quality committee, um, at that point, you can offer feedback in shaping the action plan. Um, an action plan, uh, and again, depending on the practices of the home, uh, it can be a living action plan where, you know, as you're moving along, as you're ticking off your boxes and, um, and gaining ground and in some of the uh, goals, um, it might shift a little bit. And, uh, you know, we, we saw that when there is a, you know, when the pandemic first hit, uh, some of the actions we just were not able to do because, um, you know, we just couldn't deliver recreation in the way that, you know, we have classically. Um, and so some of those actions, you know, in, in 2020 did get sidelined. Um, Whereas, uh, you know, there, there might be a way to revisit the action plan, um, especially if there's kind of a midpoint in the year where there's a report back uh, to the committee on, you know, what's gone on so far in the past six months and, you know, where, where are we at and what do we have left to take a look at in the next uh, subsequent six months. So I hope that... Thank you. I know that one's a tricky, challenging question because it's not just quality improvement, but also kind of something that is very organic afterwards. Um, so one of the participants said it was great to see all of the different committees that Belmont has. Um, they wanted to know how does looking at diversity and inclusion factor into quality improvement? Yeah, definitely. Um, so Again, uh, some homes may have a strategy for uh, diversity, equity, and, and inclusion, um, if not, you know, a policy on how they practice this. Um, so it would be good to be aware of where the home stands in terms of uh, this area. Um, and again, I would just take a look at uh, the setup of, um, you know, communications, how, you uh, how announcements go out um, to ensure that they are um, being received by everyone who, uh, you know, who could be involved. Um, so if it means offering, uh, you know, interpretation, um, if, uh, you know, back, I, I'm talking back in the days like it was years ago, but I'm, I'm talking about prior to the pandemic, um, you know, when things were in person, uh, there would be consideration for, you know, offering different kinds of um, uh, refreshments um, and, you know, halal choices, that sort of thing. Um, and yeah, just ensuring that there there's representation around the table uh, and, and everyone can kind of share the air. Thank you so much. And I see someone's got their hand raised. I'm going to see if I can let them unmute. So Anne-Marie, uh, if you want, you should be able to hopefully un unmute your mic and ask the question. All right, I guess Anne Marie didn't want to ask her question, but that's okay. Thank you so much, Hannah, for taking the time out of your busy schedule uh, to share a little bit about quality improvement. And it was really exciting to hear about the Butterfly Initiative. And uh, we look forward to hearing more about what happens. So please follow up with us and let us know, you know, what you decide to do moving forward and how you're going to roll out maybe home-wide. Um, but thank you so much. We do appreciate your expertise on quality improvement and just ways that family councils and families can engage in supporting that process within their long-term care homes. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Hi. Um, so we're going to just take a brief, I want to say about two minute uh, stretch so you can get up, go to the bathroom, stretch your legs as we transition from one, ses one session to another. I'm just going to pause the recording. Res 
All righty. Well, welcome back, everyone. I am so excited you could join us for our second presentation this afternoon focused on palliative care. So we have two wonderful speakers with us with us today. Nadine works part-time with Hospice Palliative Care Ontario as the Director of Education and Strategic Partnership. She's a passionate advocate for palliative care and community health, which has been reflected in her various professional and volunteer roles, including as the Executive Director of the Champlain Hospice Palliative Care Program, the National Director of Programs and Public Policy for the Kidney Foundation of Canada, and Vice Chair of the Carlington Community Health Centre Board. Nadine is an instructor with the Mindfulness Informed End of Life Care Program at the University of Toronto, and she is a certified teen coach and integrated professional coach. Tara Cohen is also presenting with Nadine, and she is a registered social worker and mindfulness instructor who is deeply committed to supporting people and achieving their optimal quality of life throughout their life journey. Tara works in the health system and planning at the Champlain Hospice Palliative Care Program, where she supports hospice, hospital, long-term care, and community organizations to develop palliative and end-of-life care programs. Tara's hope is to respond to the needs and suffering of individuals, families, and health care teams as they walk their unique and collective paths through life, including illness, dying, death, and grief. So thank you so much to both of you, Tara and Nadine, for joining us today. And I am going to turn the session over to both of you. Wonderful. Thank, thank you. you very much. So we will just jump right in. Um, and I wanted to start first with just a little overview of what we're hoping to talk about today. So first of all, what is a palliative approach to care and five things that you should know about a palliative approach to care. And we'll go through a little case study so that we can um, look at and think about what a palliative care uh, approach can include. And we'll make sure we leave lots of time for questions and answers so that we have a chance to have a bit of interaction. Um, as we go along, please feel free to put your questions in the chat and we'll be monitoring that to make sure that we try and address everything. And before we get started, I wanted to do a land acknowledgement. I know there are people joining us from across the province. I am in Ottawa, which is the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. And it's really important to me to do this land acknowledgement as part of truth and reconciliation and our work in palliative care. Palliative care, there's a quote that we often use from Dame Cicely Sanders, who is considered the founder of the modern hospice movement. And it's that you matter because you are you and you matter until the end of your life. But our colonial system has shown us that not everybody truly has mattered. And um, in my lifetime, we've had residential schools, the 60s scoop, uh, missing and murdered Indigenous women. So it's really important to honor truth and reconciliation as we talk about the importance of whole person care and how we can make sure that all of our work includes diversity, equity, and inclusion. So what is a palliative approach to care? Um, we're going to go into some detail about this, but before we do, I was wondering if you can put in the chat, what are some of the things that come to mind when you hear the word palliative care? And I'm not sure that I can see the chat. <clears throat> So, I could see Nadine, so I could share okay. as people add in. Just a quick free association. If there's any words that come to mind. So I see painless, hospice care, end of life care, peace, comfort. When you have a terminal illness, comfort care, holistic maximizing quality of life, aromatherapy, 
So it sounds like this is a group that already has a really good understanding of palliative approach to care. So some of what we talk about, I'm sure will be a little bit of repetition for you. And hopefully you'll also learn some, some new things and be able to share some things with each other about what a palliative approach to care means to you. So before we um, talk about what palliative care is and a palliative approach to care is, uh, let's talk about some of the myths that are out there. Um, so you can see there, palliative care is only provided in the hospital. Treatment stops when palliative care starts. Pain and dying go hand in hand. Any other myths that you can think of? And again, you can put those in the chat. What are some of the things that, that uh, maybe are aren't truths about palliative care. You could also add things that you're not sure about, things you may have heard of that may or may not be true. We could help clear those up. So palliative care is the same as end of life. Yeah, that's a big one. People think that palliative care is just last days or, or weeks of life. Yeah, so she'd indicated that that is a myth. <laughs> okay. Yeah, some of the other things that we've heard are things like palliative care hastens death, um, that it's only for people with cancer, um, and that uh, there are some people who think that uh, if they choose palliative care or palliative approach to care, that it's giving up, that it's taking away hope. Another one that was added, Nadine, is that the process is the same for everyone, that needs are universal. Oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. And when we're talking about palliative care, it really is all about the uniqueness of the individual and the care that, that they want and need. So before we go into that, I'm going to show this video about what you need to know about palliative care. I'm hoping it works well. If I just uh, click from here, we'll see. Nope, that didn't work. Oh, how about this? There we go. Introduction to palliative care. World Health Organization defines palliative care as an approach to improve quality of life of patients and their families facing problems associated with life-threatening illnesses through prevention and relief of suffering by means of early identification, assessment, and treatment of pain and other distressing problems, be it physical, psychosocial, and spiritual. While illness weakens the patient's foundations, palliative care offers a stronger layer of support system to help patients live as actively as possible until death. Anyone with life-threatening illnesses can receive palliative care. These include patients with advanced cancer, chronic organ failure such as kidney, heart and liver failure, cruelty related illness such as advanced dementia, or Parkinson's disease. Palliative care is provided to patients at their home, in nursing homes, hospices, specialist clinics, community hospitals, and acute hospitals. There are various ways to achieve this aim. By using medication to treat pain and other symptoms, supporting patients and families in complex decision-making and advanced care planning providing psychosocial support to help patients and families in coping with illness, as well as offering grief and bereavement support. A multidisciplinary team is essential to support patients and their loved ones. The team usually consists of doctors, nurses, social workers, therapists such as physiotherapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists, music and art therapists, dietitians, and psychologists. In conclusion, these are some general principles of palliative care. Palliative care affirms life and regards dying as a normal process. The intention of palliative care is neither to hasten nor postpone death. Quality of care is enhanced through management of symptoms such as pain, nausea and vomiting, 
delirium in others. Palliative care uses a team approach to address the needs of patients and family. I particularly like the piece about palliative care being a foundation. And part of that foundation includes these five things we think everybody needs to know about palliative care. Focus on quality of life, holistic care, earlier the better, team approach, and person-centered care. So we're gonna go into more detail about each of these things, starting with focus on quality of life. So for as long as we've had palliative care, there has been a discussion of what to call it. Um, as we saw in the chat in the beginning, um, you know, typically when people hear the word palliative care, they, they often think of death and dying as, as the first and main thing. This group was actually a little different <laughs> in that you already have an understanding of a palliative approach to care and, and what it can bring. Um, but and, and that's the reality of what's at the heart of hospice palliative care is that focus on quality of life. So if we're going to use any other term for palliative care, I often sometimes substitute quality of life care. And quality of life is really unique to every individual. It's asking and understanding what do I need to know about you to give you the best care possible. And part of understanding each individual and their needs and their goals and wishes and values is having advanced care planning conversations and goals of care conversations. So we show this continuum of conversations um, to illustrate the fact that advanced care planning can, can start at any time. It's not just something that is uh, for end of life, and we hope people are having lots of discussions before they get to long term care. Um, I know Tara and I have both had discussions with our, um, our kids as they were growing up as teenagers and especially once they got their licenses. Uh, I'm sure Tara, Tara's kids like mine uh, just kind of are a little tired about talking about all of this stuff, roll their eyes eye whenever rolling. they raise it. Yes, <laughs> a lot, lot of eye rolling. But it's important to understand what's important to each individual and then using that information to help inform treatment choice, which is what those goals of care discussions are all about. Um, when we first started doing advanced care planning workshops, I shared some of the things in those workshops that were important to me. Uh, so things like, you know, snuggling with my dog, tea and a good book. And I also mentioned the importance of music and my friends and family and having warm fuzzy socks. <laughs> which uh, then became a thing. The more I talked about this, uh, the more fuzzy socks I received. So I now have a very healthy stockpile of healthy socks, <laughs> of healthy socks, of fuzzy socks. Um, so that's part of the perils of having advanced care <laughs> planning conversations and uh, very openly expressing what's important to you. But you might think of oh, what does fuzzy socks have to do with making treatment choice. But it's, uh, for me, all about the importance of um, being comfortable, being supported, um, being with my friends and family. And that, those are all things that can be used to help guide treatment choice and decisions. So this is an uh, um, infographic or a cartoon that the Champlain Hospice Palliative Care Program put together specifically for long-term care to help illustrate ideas for having goals of care conversations and some of the elements that should be included in goals of care conversations. 
So when you're having a goals of care conversation, it's important to understand the nature of the illness and how that illness might change over time. Uh, any information that might be important for you to know that will help you make decisions, to be able to share your concerns and ask for supports or share your fears and what, uh, what you might anticipate you might need, sharing information about what makes you uniquely you. And so I, I just shared some of the things that make me uniquely me. Um, and what are your goals? What do you want to have happen as your illness progresses? Another piece of a palliative approach to care is that it's holistic care. The goal is to meet the whole spectrum of a person's needs. It's not just about pain and symptom management, it's also about spiritual and psychosocial support. So it's uh, making sure to examine the different aspects of a person's life and uh, understanding their relationships, religion, culture, other things that are important to them that are going to help support that quality of life that we're looking for. We also wanna make sure that it happens earlier. We talked about uh, in the, with the palliative care myths that often people think it's for the last uh, days or weeks of life. But we know from the research that the earlier palliative care can start, the better that people report their quality of life and their outcomes and their connections. Nadine, before you just show the video, could I jump in with that a little mm -hmm. bit? Yeah, I guess I just wanted to share that. So in the work I've been doing with CLRI, so I don't know if participants are aware of the Centers for Learning, Research and Innovation and Long-Term Care. Um, but there's a project that's been happening with long-term care homes in Toronto, uh, not in Toronto, sorry, I apologize, in Ontario, where um, homes can participate in a collaborative project and the project is looking at embedding palliative approaches to care. And this is one of the things that we're really focusing on sort of uh, changing the understanding of what palliative care or a palliative approach to care is. And really the recognition, again, the earlier, the better. So having discussions with long-term care team members, um, people living in long-term care and families, that for the most part, people when they arrive at long-term care could really benefit from the moment they arrive that first day from a palliative approach to care. And, and, and the hope is really to switch, um, you know, for, for, for team members and families alike who are who are feeling some resistance to hearing the word palliative because maybe there's some fear or conjures up supporting dying really changing the perspective that this is about quality of life and we could do this from the day that people arrive at long-term care. No. Thank you. So this just summarizes a little bit about what Tara just uh, mentioned as well. What comes to your mind when you hear or see the word palliative? Many people appropriately think of words such as compassion, dignity, or quality of life. However, for many people, what comes immediately to mind are the words dying, terminal, and end of life. Unfortunately, too few people think of palliative care alongside treatments to control the disease. I'm Dr. Morgan Yates, I'm a palliative physician at the University of Ottawa, and clinical content editor of Pali in Canada. The aim of this is to explain that community care is not something that missed the last days or weeks of life to be initiated much earlier. To better understand this, let's look at the illness trajectory starting at the time of diagnosis of a life threatening illness. In some cases, the disease, whether it be cancer or another non cancer disease, can be cured with treatments. In other cases, however, the disease may be incurable. Let's draw a graph around this journey. On the x-axis is the length of that journey from diagnosis to death. On the y-axis is the goals of care, the treatment and care options in focus. 
Now, unfortunately, because people often think of palliative care only for the last days or weeks of life, they will only activate a palliative care approach in the last days or weeks of life. Let's look at the negative consequences of this. They include lack of symptom control with unnecessary suffering, inappropriate treatment choices, prolonged psychological distress because no one is addressing the fears and concerns of the patient, lack of discussions about prognosis, or lack of preparation regarding care choices and treatment goals. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to erase the old model of palliative care and use a different model, a different approach. What if we start palliating early in the illness? This does not mean that treatments to control or cure the disease and palliation and supportive care are mutually exclusive. The model of early palliative care is much more patient-centered and responsive to patient needs. Is there evidence to show that early palliative care is better than late palliative care? In a large US-based study by Temel and colleagues, the model of early palliative care was compared to the usual or common model of palliative care, only in the late phase of disease. What do you think the results were? Which group do you think did better? Which group had less depression and less anxiety? Which group had better quality of life and symptom control throughout their illness? Which group do you think lived longer? The early palliative care group experienced significantly less depression and anxiety, better quality of life, better symptom control, and astoundingly, they lived almost three months longer than those patients who received only late palliative care. So the key message is palliative care early is better than palliative care late. Another important part of a palliative approach to care is that it's a team approach. And this came up in the first video as well that it's not just the, uh, the staff at the long-term care home, it is also volunteers, it is also family members, it is also whoever is in that person's circle of care and support. And in thinking about palliative care and the team approach, um, given this, this image of what palliative care really is and all of these different dimensions and aspects. Um, to, to use this to help think about what you can contribute to a palliative approach to care. What are some of the ways that you could help meet somebody's uh, need for, um, for social care, for community involvement? Um, one of the things on, on this uh, picture, this image is legacy and the importance of legacy um, and, and meaning making activities. So what can you contribute, but also, you know, what, what makes you a little nervous? Where might you need to ask for help to provide a palliative approach to care? And in all of this, communication is key. Obviously, we all come with our own unique perspective. We all see different things. We all understand different things and different ways. Um, so it's, it's a, essential to continually build good communication skills and communicate with each other in a way that fosters compassionate communication. And some of the things that Tara and I share in some of the workshops that we've done together, uh, for example, as some of you might have heard of compassionate communication uh, with Marshall Rosenberg. Um, so it's a, it's a particular way of framing a conversation and communicating uh, what your needs and your feelings are. And we can share information and a link to more, more about that afterwards if people are interested in learning about it. Another uh, framework that's really helpful sometimes to use in communication is I worry, I wish, I wonder. 
Um, and that might be easier to remember in the moment if you're dealing with a situation where you have to communicate something, it's a really nice handy framework to, to use. So for example, um, I worry that mom is spending too much time on her own and I wish I could be with her more often. I wonder if we could talk about other ways to make sure that she's getting some of the support that she needs. It's just a really simple example of using that kind of framework uh, in order to be able to communicate what you want and need uh, and what your family member might want and need um, in a way that's compassionate, but also really clear. And so all of this together, so focusing on quality of life, holistic care, a team approach that involves the whole person is a person-centered approach to care. And it is, it's acknowledging and respecting that people have unique needs and it meets them where they're at. It helps recognize that we're all unique in, in what makes us feel our best. And, um, and we hope a palliative, a palliative approach to care can support people to live the kind of quality of life that they want for as long as possible. So to help go into that in even more um, detail, to work through what a palliative approach to care can look like in reality, I'll turn it over to Tara. Thanks, Nadine. I appreciate you walking through all the steps, like these five things that you know we have learned in the work that we do that are really important to um, to working and supporting people from a palliative approach. Regardless of, of environments, we've definitely seen that this is a beneficial uh, framework in, in different settings. The example we're going to go through here today, uh, this is a little case study, and this is your opportunity as participants. We're going to put you to work. No pressure, though, and there's no grade, there's no judgment, but we're hoping that you're going to see this as a, as a fun activity and an opportunity to really envision. <laughs> Hearing so some we, noise. Yeah, okay. Yes, somebody um, is trying to call me. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, so this is an opportunity to envision based on what Nadine just shared um, about quality of life, the earlier the better, you know, thinking about a person's life from a holistic point of view and, and envisioning a team approach. We are gonna look at how we could support Mrs. K and I'm gonna ask you to jump in using the chat box as we go. So let's just look at Mrs. K. Um, what we know about her is that she has severe chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. She's been living in a retirement home or a long-term care home for two years. She's had frequent visits to the emergency room for recurrent pulmonary infections. And she's feeling really tired of living with the poor quality of life that she feels she's experiencing. We know that Mrs. K has an adult son who visits regularly and she also has a young adult grandson who comes to see her as well. If you don't mind, Nadine, thank you. Um, so again, Mrs. K's situation, we just heard a little bit about what she's experiencing and how she's feeling about it. We're going to try our best to incorporate her perspective, you know, knowing what we know about her and also using our imaginations a little bit, what we might imagine she's, she's thinking, either because we've had family, um, or just getting creative and imagining. We're gonna imagine what her family might be experiencing and then you know, perhaps how the team at the home, the, the uh, team members in the long-term care home could also be supportive. So again, we're gonna bring in quality of life. We're gonna look at holistic. We're gonna look at Mrs. K from a holistic point of view. We're gonna imagine the care, um, the palliative approach to care being implemented from the day she arrives. Well, not from the day, because she's been there two years. From the moment that we have this conversation, um, and again, this is all creating person-centered, this is all person-centered approach. So really meeting Mrs. K where she's at as a human being. This is just a little bit of, um, this is based on research and what we've heard from families, just to add a little more, um, a little more context, you know, and for you as, as if we have family members, I imagine we have a lot of family members on the call. 
Um, we, we have heard that families really want to have a sense of control, that there's a lot of challenging situations, they're feeling out of control, and that's challenging. Families um, really want to receive, they, they want their person to receive adequate pain and symptom management. They want to avoid, families like to avoid unnecessary pro prolongation of dying. Um, there's a desire to re relieve burden. And ultimately, families are looking to strengthen relationships during this time, not to have them fractured, um, fractured any further or fractured at all. So we you know, this might factor into some of the ideas that you have for creating a care plan, a palliative approach to care care plan for Mrs. K. So here I'm going to present just some basic ideas, things that are fairly typical um, that might come up as part of the care plan for Mrs. K. So in terms of the pain she's experiencing, there might be some ideas around providing an A535 massage. There might be physio assessment. She might be given Tylenol PRN to support Mrs. K with her shortness of breath. There might be a small dose of morphine. There might be um, optimization of bronchiodilators, a portable fan, and maybe looking at anxiety if Mrs. K is feeling short of breath due to, due some, due to some anxiety. And finally, in terms of the environment, <clears throat> Um, some of the ideas to support Mrs. K in that way might be around distraction. What kind of activities can Mrs. K participate in? <coughs> Looking at communication with um, Mrs. K's son and grandson and trying to get them involved, you know, based on their knowledge and expertise of Mrs. K being family and knowing more about her, potentially, um, hearing their point of view of what might be supportive and enhancing quality of life. So those are some of the, the basics in the care plan. What we're hoping to do here is in the chat box <clears throat> to hear your ideas based on what you've learned today about a palliative approach to care. How could we, how can we care for Mrs. K in a more robust way using the palliative approach? What more could we offer her to enhance her quality of life? <clears throat> So you could approach this in different ways as family members, you could sort of suggest, or if you have ideas for different team members at the home, it could be dietary, it could be recreation, it could be nursing. If you have ideas, the way other people can contribute, feel free just to suggest those as well. So again, free association, there doesn't, there's no right or wrong here. We're just, we're just working on building these together. So I see there's, question. Okay, so Chad is disabled. Thanks for letting us know, Val. Um, so I see that um, someone has shared thoughtful, loving care with dignity. There's a question, what about residents in long-term care who have no one at all to help with palliative care? And Monique has asked, have you asked Mrs. K what she wants, which is a great Ooh. point, right? So if we go back a couple of slides, I appreciate you pointing that out, Monique. Thanks, Nadine. So yeah, oh, go back where you just were, go forward one more. So here, Mrs. K situation, you're absolutely right, Monique. The individual is first, right? So that would be extremely important to check in with Mrs. K and see what she suggests would bring her quality of life, right? I'm I'm sort of torn here between the questions and answer in the chat box. I'm going back and forth. So <laughs> there's so many good ideas. You guys are amazing. So I'm seeing singing to her, something for spirituality, mindfulness, a journal, journal to help her write down her thoughts and feelings, maybe meditation, special breathing, hand massage, dim lighting, battery candles, work on anxiety management. All of those things work on anxiety. Um, ask Mrs. K what she wants versus what the family wants, which I think is a really important conversation to have just to see if things are aligned and if they're not aligned, to make sure that we're respecting what the individual themselves, what feels important to them to contribute to their quality of life. Um, be totally honest about what's happening in the ultimate outcome. And I appreciate that, Brenda. And I think this is like, this one's a little bit tricky, right? Um, I think I think for some people, it's really important. For them, 
for them to know what's happening, what the ultimate income, outcome is, and for other people they don't want to know. But what I think as team members or as family members, we need to ask that question. Is it important to you to know what's happening? Or if you don't want to know, who would be the right person to tell? So really making sure that we um, we have an understanding of these things so we can care for a person in the way that feels most appropriate for them. Leah, I see you've seen respiratory therapists monitoring and education to staff. Trauma-informed care. So thanks for adding that, Jasper. That's something that um, the Champlain Hospice Palliative Care Program, the program I work for, we actually have an education session on integrating uh, trauma-informed care into, pal into palliative care with the recognition that many people experience have experienced trauma and that you know, as people are in long-term care, we have to be really careful about how we approach people not to um, not to re-traumatize them. So absolutely for teams to have an understanding of how they could work from that perspective, right? In terms of letting people know ahead of time what to expect and understanding some of the reactions that we might see from people that are a trauma response as opposed to a behavioral response. Um, Erica says religious support, if that's something that Mrs. K wants, absolutely. This is some of the work that we do around cultural humility is explaining to teams and families that we can't know everything about every culture, but to approach from a, a perspective of cultural humility. So that's learning how to ask the questions. What about your culture is important to you? What do I need to know about your culture to provide the best care to you possible? Um, and then just again, asking the questions, is there anything you want to tell me about your culture, things that would help you feel supported? I see music therapy um, to help reduce pain, promote a pleasurable experience, promote reminiscence, mm -hmm. um, and that could be done with family members. Um, I also see, so long-term care homes need to learn how to work with family who are in denial, which then delays appropriate care. And this goes, I think, to what Nadine is saying around communication. Right, like, and also compassion. We have to approach from a compassionate stance, and 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 to have proper communication. So Nadine offered a couple of frameworks. The first is, I wonder, I wish, I worry, and the other is compassionate communication or nonviolent communication, which we've used quite a bit um, with healthcare teams. Like we've worked with healthcare teams and families to be able to to understand how to communicate 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 in a way that re removes judgment, because when judgment is removed from language we could really hear each other. We're not busy defending ourselves. We're able to hear each other. So just like quickly, compassionate communication is a four-step process where you make an observation, you share your feelings. So it could be when mom doesn't get up for breakfast, I feel sad, I feel worried. Food means a lot to me. I need, um, I need to know that mom is being, you know, I need to know that mom is, is, is getting the food she needs. Would you be, and then the fourth part is making a request. Would you be willing to have a further conversation about how we can make sure that mom's, you know, food requirements are being met, but in a way that works for everyone or something to that effect. It's just a four step process so that nobody feels that they're being accused of anything. Um, there are a couple more comments about me checking in with Mrs. K, seeing if she has questions. Pets, which are always, you know, well, I would, I shouldn't say always, I guess I'm a pet lover. So pets always seem like a great idea to me, but I guess if you don't love pets, but for some people, it really uh, brightens up their day. Absolutely. Um, memory boxes, letting Mrs. K guide the process in some of these decisions. More about communication. Okay, so thank you so much, everyone. And the last one, would you like to discuss anticipatory grief for you and your family? So opening that conversation potentially, right, around grief, which we know in long-term care, there are a lot of losses that happen over a period of time, you know, from having to potentially leave your family home and to be living in a different place to, you know, some of the physical and, and social and all the other losses that happen over over a, a, you know, what could potentially be a, a you know, a, a tr illness trajectory. So, and, and the losses that people have experienced over COVID as well, there were many things that, that, that were part of our day-to-day -day experience that we lost very, very quickly and very suddenly. And um, 
and we're still experiencing um, the the grief from those losses. Absolutely. Thanks, Nadine. Yeah, I think that's it's such an important point too, right? Like there, all these losses were present before COVID, but since COVID, we definitely are hearing from people living in long-term care and their families that the loss of predictability, the loss of being able to see and touch one another, um, and some of the impacts that are ongoing as a result of that have really created challenging situations. So yeah, giving people opportunities to sort of reflect on that and share what it was like and um, you know, find their way back to something that feels feels better. So first, let me say that you all did a beautiful job of integrating some of these ideas. That was fantastic. Um, I, you know, I guess I was I was thinking that what I was curious about, rather than what I was thinking, what I was curious about is, does this feel different? You know, is this envisioning or recognizing these? pieces as a part of a palliative approach to care is that different than what you thought about palliative care before we had this conversation I'm just curious in the chat box yes or no like would you have considered some of these ideas that you just shared part of palliative care I'm looking at the chat box to see if anybody says, yes, this is what you would consider. No, no, this is not what you would have considered. These ideas are just good care. Thank you, Leah. What I like about that is it it, it puts, um, puts people back into the frame that there are lots of things that you can do to contribute to quality of life. And I think sometimes we can get get ourselves intimidated by, you know, what can, what can we possibly offer? There's a whole lot that we can yeah. offer that will help improve people. Well, well <laughs> Kathleen talked about earlier about being tongue-tied. I clearly need some more coffee that will help improve quality of life for people. Yeah, absolutely. And what I love about having this conversation with people is that very often, you know, in the work Nadine and I have been doing these last years is we still hear resistance around the term palliative. People still feel cautious or a little bit afraid, right? Because we hear often families will say, we're not ready for that. We're not ready for palliative care. My person isn't dying. And like, I love after we do these sessions that people are like, oh, these are the things we're already doing. This is person-centered or this is people are like, oh yeah, I cared for my mom this way, which I'm seeing in the chat box. And when they could start to associate like these positive things that they're doing with a palliative approach, it really changes their perspective on palliative care. It feels less scary, right? It sort of reorients into palliative care being something that they want for their family member, as opposed to it being something that they're, they're not ready for or they don't want. So I'm just going to go back to the chat box here quickly um, just to see the answers to my question. So I'm saying, yes, I, I have done this. Um, yeah, the association with resident directed care, even more so because it's when someone is in need of specific, specific care due to, de I think, declining health issues. Lots of great ideas. We're focused on this approach now more than ever. Um, I think this comment I thought about only as late stage. So I think that's the change in thinking palliative care late, at, uh, moving towards early. And then the final question, which is why not change the word then? So I appreciate that question, Fred. And it's a conversation those of us working in palliative care have been having forever. We're, we don't want to change the word, I guess, because we see it as uh, we see it the way that we're describing it today. So what we're really hoping is to change how other people, you know, ch changing how the word is perceived. Yeah. So we, uh, we've also had the, the conversation about uh, because of what palliative care offers, which includes, um, you know, quality of life right up until death. So death is, is part of it. Um, so in many ways, it doesn't matter what we call it. It's educating people about what a palliative approach to care means. I've heard somebody say before, we could call it unicorn care. Yeah. <laughs> and we would still have this problem mm -hmm. because 
because of the associations that people have with it. But it is an ongoing debate, and I've heard, you know, supportive care, comfort care, um, quality and then of care. I would care. also throw in that to palliate is to soothe, right? Mm -hmm. So if we think about palliative care as soothing, then I then I guess the hope is that people feel comforted by soothing, right? It's not something that again to be afraid of. So. So I don't know, Fred, I hope, I don't know. I hope that feels okay to you. I hope that's a decent explanation for why we keep hanging on to palliative care. Mm -hmm. um, I see Tammy that you've added one, uh, a comment here. I noticed a huge difference in losing my mother-in-law who was in a hospice versus losing my grandmother at the care home. Thankfully, I met with the care home afterwards and they have made some wonderful changes based on my experience, which is awesome to hear. Their care was great, but now it's even better, which is amazing, mm -hmm. right? We are all on a journey. We are all um, you know, looking to work together to improve the experience for people living in long-term care and the experience of families. Um, so I very much appreciate your input and in sort of creating this beautiful care plan for Mrs. K and the other thoughts that you've shared. I know we have 13 minutes left and we would love if you have specific thoughts or questions that you want to share with us. Um, I'll start here with Chris. I see you've put in the chat box. When I do the palliative when I do the palliative approach, consents with family, I explain palliative and end of life are much like dementia and Alzheimer's. And most people use them interchangeably, interchangeably which causes confusion. Okay, so I hear what you're saying. Yeah, thank you for that. So yeah, part of this is just education, right? Explaining that, you know, and we do the same. When we talk about a palliative approach to care, we say palliative approach is, is broad um, and just end of life care is a little circle contained within a palliative approach to care, right? The end of end of life is part of, um, you know, the a palliative approach could address people at end of life, but palliative care is not exclusive to end of life care. Yeah. Any other thoughts, questions? Nadine, Sarah, would you like me to to uh, to go to the the last video that we have? And then people oh, I forgot about, about that. that have yeah. any questions <laughs> Good point. and then we can leave some time at the end we can take the presentation down so that potentially people can I don't know if they can unmute or we can continue to do it in the chat but yeah that sounds great Nadine let's watch that last video because it's a nice one and illness is um is a story for people it's a chapter in their life and maybe in some cases we're talking about the last chapter in their life and that story of what happens is how we think, it's how we breathe, it's how we live our whole life. I don't think it takes a family member um, facing a terminal illness to recognize that we're not handling these problems very well. Everybody has a different set of priorities besides just living longer, and they really matter in their lives, and they want us to serve them. The most reliable way to find out what people's priorities are is just to ask. And we don't ask. There is the anxiety of the doctor or any clinician, doctor, nurse, about being able to talk about these issues. I could go to the operating room and I could I could come out and we we will have fixed the problem, and that's incredibly gratifying. When it's a unfixable problem where they are you're dealing with someone whose frailty is just getting worse, their chronic illness is not getting better, they're they're terminally ill, and you're not changing that trajectory. Well, that is where you feel really incompetent. We haven't um, had the skills to handle those situations. In one study of cancer patients, for example, less than a third had any kind of a discussion about their goals and priorities for the end of their life. The people who had that discussion had remarkably better outcomes in terms of spending more time at home, having less suffering in the course of their care, um, being able to avoid dying in the hospital or in the intensive care unit if they didn't want to. Their family members had less depression and post-traumatic stress disorder six months after the person died. Our core values are that the priorities are health and survival. When you start saying the people have priorities besides just survival. In fact, well-being for people is bigger than just surviving and being a pulsing organism that's kept alive. 
then you realize that we're going to need to change from a very narrow medical viewpoint to a larger viewpoint. For my father, I'd say for both of my parents, their Hindu faith was really important to them, especially my father, as he faced what he knew was going to be his death. People in medicine underestimate how important religion is to people. In the top three priorities that people name, uh, being at peace with God as they face the end of life is really important to them. Um, and much farther down on the list is living as long as possible, no matter what. Floating on that swollen Ganges River, I could not help sensing the hands of the many generations connected across time. And bring us there, my father helped us see that he was part of a story going back thousands of years, and so were we. We were lucky to get to hear him tell us his wishes and say his goodbyes. And having a chance to do so, he, he let us know he was at peace. That let us be at peace too. After spraying my father's ashes, we floated silently for a while, letting the current take us. As the sun burned away the mist, it began warming our bones. Then we gave a signal to the boatman and he picked up his oars. We headed back toward the shore. And illness is... Um, I love a number of things about that video. Given what we were just talking about, Mrs. K's case study, one of the things that always jumps to mind when I see the woman and her hands on her lap and her nails painted that lovely shade of pink that, uh, you know, in some cases, nail polish is a palliative approach to care. <laughs> Yeah, if we could really broaden that definition, right? Like if that helps people feel like they are maintaining their dignity or feeling, you know, just if they're, if that's important to them as part of their personal appearance. Absolutely. So just going to the chat box, I'm seeing a few things. I think we'll just skip over that, Nadine. I don't know that we have time. So we're going to, we have seven minutes left together. Um, Actually, can we yeah. Sorry, Nadine, did you, did you want yeah, to? Yeah, I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen and that way we can just uh, maybe see. That sounds good. Yeah, so Tammy mentioned here having family councils members, family council members stay on with family council after losing a loved one is so beneficial as it brings experience and perspective. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Mark has asked, how do you deal with people's fear? Which I think is a beautiful question. And I have to say, like, you know, in this work that I do um, within systems, but also in, in, in my private practice as a grief therapist, um, where I see many people who are experiencing illness and dying, um, I think that's one of the things that comes up most, right? It's pretty natural that we have fears, fears of what's going to happen to us, fears of what's going to happen to our family, fear, you know, uh, being afraid of our bodies and what the end is going to bring. And I think being there, like more than anything, it's, it's the best thing I could offer, which is being willing to sit with another person in their suffering and giving them a space where they could openly express those fears. Um, and I don't know if that's satisfying, Mark, but I think that's the truth is really, we can't fix people's fears, right? We can't take them away necessarily. We could, we could try to say that we will do our best to address things if, if pain is an issue or loss of dignity is an issue. We could certainly try to address those specific things. Um, but fear is, fear is pretty natural, right? So just being with someone while they express that is really, is pretty big. I think that really helps. Yeah, never underestimate the incredible power of being fully present. Yeah, absolutely. And Crystal, I hear what you're saying, you know, that you know, you've mentioned that sometimes services such as physio, massage, um, you know, opportunities for social connection are limited, you know, if, if we could be able to provide those, um, you know, that, that that is helpful, but with program cuts and staffing shortages and things like that, we know that sometimes these are challenges. And that's why we hope in, in, the, in these discussions we have that we're kind of opening possibilities you know, I, I I don't think we're kind, we're, we're not delusional. We recognize that sometimes these, you know, these challenges do exist, but what we hope 
is that we work with what we have. We do, we do something, you know, so I think broadening the idea of a, the broadening the understanding of a pilot of approach to care to include things like putting nail polish on or like looking at just like opening things up gives us the, the you know the possibility of other people other people being able to contribute it's not just specific people it's everyone so if we can't do this can we do that you know um i see there is a comment, Ontario policy that families need to clear out their loved one's room within 24 hours after death feels very inhumane. Agreed. Agreed, right? You know, and I think we've seen different things that, um, you know, for, for some people that that feels like what they need to do, what they want to do is, is to sort of get that done with quickly and move on. But for other people, so that's unimaginable. And yeah, I, it would be really nice if we could, if we could do that on, you know, a person by person basis, what feels right to the family. How would dementia impact the palliative process as defined here? Thanks for that, Barbara. So I don't, you know, in some ways it doesn't, you know, when we talk about a broader definition of a palliative approach to care, we're looking at quality of life as, you know, Dean mentioned earlier in the presentation, talking about advanced care planning. Our hopes are that, you know, this moves upstream, that people are having conversations about what is important to them earlier on while they have mental the mental capacity to be able to share that with their substitute decision makers. If that hasn't happened, if a person hasn't identified their SDM and hasn't had these specific conversations, we do the best we can with what we know, right? We hope that the substitute decision maker and we hope that family members have an idea and they do the best. They do the best they can to share what they think would be important to their person, not what's important to them, but what they truly believe in their hearts would have been what the person would have wanted for themselves. And that's making the assumption that with dementia, you know, I, I'm imagining the later stages, dementia, dementia, where a person may not have mental capability in the earlier stages, you know, it's really just about asking, you know, what, what, what does care look like for you? How can we care for you in a way that feels good? And we often talk about uh, finding the path of least regret, mm, yeah. that if you're making um, decisions for somebody uh, who has dementia, that you maybe can't have some of these conversations, as Tara said, you know, doing the best you can to honor what you think their their wishes, values and beliefs are. Yeah, and Kathleen is is asking, what role does palliative care look like for residents who are unfriended with family and friends, so who do not have family and friends as part of their lives? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, you know, my first thought about that is, who do they have? Who is there? Do they do they have other people that could? Um, and again, this is like this is making an assumption around that the the person isn't mentally capable to speak for themselves. If they are, then they will share themselves, but yeah, if there are no family and friends, are there other people? If there are no other people, um, then the, the team in their knowledge of the person is going to do the best they can to look at things again, like from that holistic, you know, legacy and um, social, emotional, spiritual, psychological, we do the best we can. I, I, I hope that feels okay, Kathleen, like it's not a perfect answer, but um, is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's challenging because I do know that there are some who don't. Um, so it, it can be a challenge, but I, I do appreciate a the conversation I'm seeing happening in the chat and just everyone sharing their personal stories. Um, I think there's probably one question left and then I think we'll wrap things up. I see someone asked, how do we challenge social stigma around what is quality of life for older adults? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I, like I'll just share like uh, in the um, in some of the education sessions that we're doing with, with long term care home team members, we talk often about ageism, you know, not making assumptions about people based on their age, just all old people, this or all, you know, and really, uh, I, I think the most important thing that I can offer when I'm talking to, you know, specifically team members, but I'm sure it's true for families as well. Um, is not to make assumptions, 
right? Yeah. Don't make assumptions. We always have to ask because there's no, mm -hmm. no, and no group is heterogeneous. We're always going to, it's homogeneous. Every group's heterogeneous. We're always going to see different, yeah, personal, personal beliefs and wants and needs. Yeah. And I just wanted to mention Lynn put a comment in the chat and um, she says there, that she understood the love she received from staff as well as her family. So I think even in really difficult situations, when you feel that the services and supports that you would want and need are there, that people understand love and to be fully present and to offer some of these things that we've talked about goes a long way to contributing to quality of life. Well, thank you so much, Nadine and Tara, for your wonderful presentation. And thank you. So their uh, contact information is in the chat if you would like to connect with them and learn more about the resources or programs they spoke about. Um, it, it, it's so lovely just to hear the passion you have, sharing the different resources, sharing a little bit about what it is that you've been doing with your work and the organizations that you support with. Um, it's been a wonderful presentation, even though people probably don't like talking about palliative care I found it's just been nice it's very comforting having the conversation um you know it's not really like it's a it's a formal session it's a webinar but I also find that it no you've been very welcoming you've wanted to engage people you've wanted to respond to everyone who is sharing the stories that they have so I want to thank everyone who attended today for their engagement in this session I want to thank you both for taking the time to share your expertise it's been truly appreciated and it's great uh, to have a really good conversation about palliative care especially because it is such a big part of this legislation transforming the approach from what it was to a palliative approach to care well now you can kind of have those conversations within your homes and, you know, maybe bring some different ideas that you might have heard about or programs that you've heard about uh, to have conversations in your next council meeting or uh, within your home in general. So thank you so much to both of you. Thank you so much to everyone who attended today, our day one session of the Family Council Ontario Innovation Summit. Tomorrow afternoon, we have a really good session in store. It'll be a bunch of different businesses and organizations. We're gonna come and speak a little bit about their products or services. And uh, you'll have a chance as families to ask questions to these businesses and to learn a little bit more about them with the hopes that maybe you'll see some of these really cool innovations implemented within your own long-term care homes. Thank you so much for joining us today, and I hope that you all have a wonderful evening. And thank you so much again to Tara and Nadine. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.